This is a special report from your Seattle City Light. Seattle's citizen-owned electric utility controls a large piece of wilderness in the North Cascade Mountains. The scenic Upper Skagit River watershed provides habitat and sustenance to hundreds of species of wildlife, fish, plants, and insects. It also provides a major part of the electricity that powers the urban engine of Seattle. Because Seattle operates hydroelectric dams on the Skagit River, it gives back some of the revenues from the sale of electricity to replace lost wildlife habitat and provide enhanced recreation and meaningful education for visitors about the remote ecosystem in Washington's northern mountains. In mid-September, a unique celebration was held to move forward with the educational opportunities for North Cascade visitors. The start of construction of a new environmental learning center was marked by the planting of a tree by City Light Superintendent Gary Zarker, North Cascade National Park Superintendent Bill Pallack, and Saul Weisberg, Executive Director of the North Cascades Institute. City Light is paying over $12 million for the land and construction of the 16-building complex, which will be located on the shores of Diablo Lake, about 130 miles northeast of Seattle. In addition, City Light will contribute about $9 million towards the operation and upkeep of the environmentally sustainable classrooms, residential buildings, and administrative offices. The Learning Center will be operated by the North Cascades Institute, a nonprofit major education program which uses the Skagit River's watershed from the mountain glaciers to Puget Sound as its campus. The future Environmental Learning Center will provide the Institute with facilities to enlarge its multifaceted all-ages curriculum. The North Cascade Institute is in its 15th year of providing learning adventures for the young and old citizens of Washington. The start of construction is the culmination of efforts of many different groups, both nonprofit education-based and government organizations. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to welcome all of you to this beautiful and very special place. My name is Pete Kremen. I'm the Whatcom County Executive, and I have the honor of being the Master of Ceremonies today. On this beautiful morning here in the wilderness, we're here to celebrate the emergence of the North Cascades Environmental Learning Center. This residential education center, scheduled to open in spring 2002, will be the culmination of a unique partnership between a nonprofit agency, the North Cascades Institute, a public utility, Seattle City Light, and the federal government, North Cascades National Park. The Learning Center will not simply be a group of buildings, but a very special place a hub of discovery and learning, an opportunity for people to discover our region's magnificent natural environment, wildlife, and tribal history. It'll bring lasting benefits to the people of not only Skagit and Whatcom counties, but to the Pacific Northwest, and in fact, throughout the nation. So uh, I would like to introduce our first speaker, and he is Bill Pallack, the Superintendent of North Cascades National Park Service Complex. Thank you, Pete. It is my genuine pleasure to welcome you to your North Cascades National Park Service Complex and to this special place in this vast national treasure on a very special day. Throughout the national park system, and particularly here in the Pacific Northwest, the National Park Service cares for some of the most important places in the history of the discovery, exploration, and expansion of the American West. As well as caring for these sites, we provide opportunities for every person to experience our shared national heritage. Nearby sites include Fort Vancouver, Fort Spokane, Fort Clatsop, Klondike Gold Rush, British Camp, and American Camp. These were outposts for explorers, mountain men, and adventurers that they established or came to to overwinter and rest, to resupply, to exchange information, seek security during times of crises, find new companions, and gather the courage to sally forth into the unknown once again and again 
and again. It occurs to me that we're doing something much more than the groundbreaking for an environmental learning facility here today. We are, if you will, laying the sill logs for our first outpost of the 21st century. However, ours is not established for the discovery and exploitation of geography. It's not being dedicated to the prospect of exploiting or subjugating the land. My friends, our, out, our outpost will serve a very different purpose. At this outpost, people of all ages and of all ethnic and economic backgrounds will find opportunities to grow. They will find opportunities to learn about our environment and how to apply personal discoveries to their lives and their lifestyles. They will find places to rest and reflect, to share their knowledge and understanding with others, and to resupply their spirits and intellects before once again sallying forth in the, into the challenging future we will face together. The challenges those who pass through the entrance of our outpost will face are manifest. Today we live on a planet of some six billion souls. Before, before the middle of this century, that population will grow to between 10 and 11 billion before world population is projected to slowly decline. Even today, fully one billion of our fellow travelers live at the very edge of survival in a continual state of starvation and despair. I'm assured by those who study these matters much more carefully than I that our planet has the capability to sustain us through this peak and beyond the bottleneck we have inherited and shaped, but only just barely. Just as the outpost of old, this outpost will help sh ensure our chances of survival and success. This is one of the first outposts of learning of its kind, and I'm totally confident that it will always be amongst the best, but it cannot be the last. Throughout the country, the National Park Service and our Natural Resource Challenge is committed to establishing a network of learning centers, outposts of learning that will spread across the landscape and become parts of the fabric of our nation. At the start of this century, this idea is an outpost. By the end of this century, it must be an institution. Now, it gives me great pleasure to introduce a special friend and colleague. John Reynolds is the regional director of the Pacific West region. He was a superintendent of this park from 1985 through 1988. His passionate support for an idea that became North Cascades Institute was absolutely critical to its formation and initial success. Of particular importance to our activities is the credit he genuinely deserves for the genesis of the idea of a learning center that we begin to turn into reality today. Under his leadership, the general management plan was completed in 1988. That plan raised the idea of an environmental education center to an officially identified need and a sanctioned objective. John's vision at the time was prophetic his continuing passion and support for expanding the study and learning about our environment and how to keep it whole remains an important source of inspiration and strength to us all. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me in welcoming John Reynolds back home. This is why they have these things bent. <laughs> I gotta tell you, this is a very emotional day for me. Uh, I was here from 1984 to 1988, and I look out and I see people that introduced me to what the North Cascades are really all about. Jerry Cook it took me on my first trip up, up Ross Lake and started to, it started to open my heart to what this place was. Kelly Bush climbed Mount Shookson with me. He damn near died that day, literally. <laughs> It wasn't her fault, <laughs> it was mine. Uh, Fred Darville is here, one of the very, one of the fathers, the founders of the park idea that took us through Washington, D.C. and through the Congress, Fred. It's wonderful to be here with you. I've hiked the Cascades with you. Oh, well, I'll just put it closer. John Miles over here introduced me to the ideas of universities and parks being together. 
there's just so many of you out there. Don Wick was a buddy and a friend and a collaborator that communities and parks could work together for the benefit. So many of you brought learning and emotion into my heart about these cascades, and so to be here is just absolutely, absolutely emotional. Chuck Odegaard was regional director, gave me the room to talk and think and come in and say, yeah, it's okay, John, keep going, don't stop. I just can't tell you how much I got to thank all of you. And as we talk about the North Cascades Institute, you know, it wasn't really my idea. I was new here after about a year, started talking about the idea. We ought to have an institute. We ought to be able to help use this land and these places and, and the national park and the community and connect each other. And one day a fellow by the name of Bill Lester that from those days, if you knew him, you loved him. He knew, he felt North Cascades like very, very few people ever have. Um, and he called me on the phone down at headquarters. He was at Marble Mound, and he said, John, can I bring two young seasonals down to talk with you, uh, Tom Flesher and Saul Weisberg? And I said, well, sure, come on down. So they came down a day or so later, and we chatted a little bit about education and community and the needs of the future and this and that and the other thing. And, and uh, then Tom and Saul sort of shyly pushed a little booklet across the table at me, and it was a booklet that they had done about three years before and had floated the idea of, it wasn't called the North Cascades Institute on their title, but exactly the same idea, and had not gotten exactly a, a reception. And all of a sudden I realized, you know, it's in the youth. It's in people who's, who's, who's don't have the idea yet that you can't do something, that, that the future lies, and that these two young men had had this beautiful, beautiful idea. And so we decided that day, along with Margie Allen, who at the time was, was the superintendent secretary, but Margie has a mind that um, was not being fully utilized at that time, and she's an artist, which wasn't being used at all. And the four of us decided that day that, that this idea of Tom's and Saul's should come to fruition. And so all that we did was give Margie and Tom and Saul the space and the freedom to use their time to make the dream come true. And you all know about the North Cascades Institute's field seminars, their mountain school, and they're reaching out to teachers all over the state and bringing children to the Cascades and working with agencies. And you all know that that part of their dream has long since come true. And from where I sit and the things that I see going on in the Park Service educationally and connecting community and people to the, to the environment, there is not one that is any better. Their idea has matched their enthusiasm and their intellectual ability. And today, today to start off building the educational center is a day of incredible emotion. We used to dream about the day when something might happen that could make it possible to really bring people up and to give them enough time to be here and to be able to do it regardless of the weather and bring the best people in to interact with them so that they could have the opportunity to have their lives enriched and the ideas grow in their head that it's not the city that life begins but it's trees and it's water and it's air and no matter where you live those are the things that are the most important because otherwise we won't live and to connect back and the ideas the intellect that Saul and Tom and Margie brought into this is suddenly blossomed through many, many people, the boards of directors now and in the past, many of you that have supported this, that you've gone to seminars, that you've given money, the dream is happening. And it's, a, and it's such proof that if, you, if we dream, it will happen if we're, willing to, if we're willing to invest in that dream. And I just, I cannot thank you all enough that have been involved, and particularly Tom Saul, Margie for continuing to dream, and Bill, you know, you brought your intellect to this park, and you brought your persistence to this park, and you have, and you have given the space so that that dream can continue. And 
the emotion of having the opportunity to have the North Cascades have Seattle City Light Assist in it and connect to the people of this state directly is almost overwhelming. And the citizens of the future of the United States, and particularly of Washington State, will thank all of you forever and ever and ever for dreaming. Thank you. The next speaker is uh, not only an excellent superintendent, uh, but he's one heck of a negotiator, I can attest to that. Please welcome Jerry Zorker. Imagine a million acre classroom reaching deep into landscaped glacier clad mountains, deep forests, endless streams and lakes. It's a vision of a classroom that serves thousands of uh, city and uh, rural area kids, thousands of uh, uh, citizens from around the, the world. It's a vision that I think all of the, the partners to this project have had and are now making a reality. It was a project that um, happened to come along as part of the relicensing re project for the Skagit dams, the three dams that Seattle City Light operates on this great river. Um, it was a project that, uh, like many of the others, took a lot of negotiation, a lot of great collaboration. Um, and now, like many of the other things we've worked on, this one too is coming to reality. Uh, it hasn't been an easy one. Uh, you can talk to the uh, people from the Henry, Henry Klein partnership. I think uh, Mr. Klein is here. They're the designers of this project. Um, we've had vision changes throughout this, but uh, we're now coming to the, the final part of it, and this project is going to be constructed. Uh, real credit to David Hall, who is, I think, the architect. Is David here? Yeah. Pleasure working with you. And it's been a pleasure working with Bill Pallack and Saul Weisberg. Um, it's uh, a number of people from Seattle City Light are very proud of this achievement. I should mention Lynn Best, who's been uh, involved in our uh, Skagit. Uh, raise your hand, Lynn. Uh, in our relicensing efforts from way back and has been very involved in this. Elaine Bild is our uh, director of the Environmental and Safety uh, Division. It's a, a whole host of uh, people from the City Light family are very proud of this and the other achievements. And it's more than just the $21 million that uh, was a part of the license agreement that we're contributing to make this a reality. Um, Seattle City Light is very proud of its environmental record and certainly this is one of those uh, monuments that will really be a jewel to uh, the things that we've accomplished here. But there are other things, too, that make us very proud. I stopped on the way up here this morning uh, just outside the Gorge Powerhouse and looked down on the gravel banks of uh, just full of Chinook salmon. We're keeping the uh, uh, salmon populations on the Skagit River strong uh, for future generations. It's really a great river. It's a great partnership uh, with a whole host of um, members of this community, the Park Service, uh, the tribal people. It's, it's just a wonderful accomplishment that we're very proud to be a, uh, a part of. The North Cascades Environmental Learning Center is going to be a model facility designed to bring this treasure we call the North Cascades to our citizen owners in Seattle and to communities all over uh, the Puget Sound region and in the Skagit River. We serve, and it's also going to serve thousands of other uh, international, national visitors every year. We're really pleased to be a part of it. Uh, it is going to be a reality, uh, opening in 2002, the spring, we hope. Uh, so uh, this is just the beginning of the final phase. We're proud to be a part of it. Our next speaker has already been referenced several times today for obvious and valid reasons. Uh, his name is Saul Weisberg. And please welcome him. He's the founder and executive director of North Cascades Institute. The Learning Center is a tangible, or will be the tangible expression of a central theme in institute teaching, sense of place. 
it offers both a physical place for learning and investigation discovery, but it's also a jumping off point for the imagination. It's a place for us to, to come together and think about what we can do and, and where we can go as we look at places like the North Cascades. It sits in the middle of more than 7 million acres of public land, not just this national park, but we're surrounded by three national forests, the Mount Baker, Snoqualmie, the Okanagan, the Wenatchee, uh, seven wilderness areas, three provincial parks in British Columbia, many state parks, the Loomis State Forest. It's an incredible natural classroom we have. And this place is a jumping off point for getting out into that wild land and learning and talking about it and all the human communities that, are, that interfinger through it. Nowhere else in North America are students going to have access to so much biographic, or biological and geographical diversity in such a short area. 70 miles between the, the tidewaters of Puget Sound, alpine glaciers, mountain meadows, and then the shrubs, sta sagebrush deserts of the east side, all of which will be accessible from this site. So we'll be doing a lot more here than just programs that are residentially based. We'll be doing lots of programs that meet here, start here, and then travel out into this larger ecosystem, this larger region, to find out how it's all put together. Our partnership with the National Park Service and City Light is unique in North America. Um, we've, you know, we've been talking about this kind of thing, but we've been looking now for the last 15 years at programs like this all around the world. And there is nothing like this. And one of the reasons I think the Institute's been able to be successful is because of our partnerships, partnerships with, with a variety of different federal and state agencies, the partnership with Sea Light. This is something that is causing all of us to think about relationships in new ways and how we take care of land and how we manage land in new ways. And this park, and perhaps more than many others, because we have this international border running across the top of it, is an incredible classroom for looking at how we manage land and will have to manage land and talk about land in the future. The partnership is really what's responsible for creating something that will benefit the lives of thousands and thousands of children and adults in the future. We as the operators of the center will perhaps have the most fun part, being able to talk to the kids and the students when they're here. But really, if we do our job right, they're going to all leave this place and understand the connection between wild places and when they go back to Seattle or back to other places, understand that connection when they turn that light switch on and they understand what's going on out here. And it's, it's, just, it's a challenge to educate about all these different pieces together, but it's absolutely necessary because the world is a very different place than it was even 10 years or 20 years ago. <laughs> Well, as John mentioned, and I thank him for only telling a few of the stories of those early days and not the ones he, he could and, and might have done. But when we started the Institute in 1986, it was a dream of a small group of friends, biologists, teachers, uh, writers, naturalists. We wanted to do something so we didn't have to leave this place that we called home and travel somewhere else and do this work somewhere else. And so in our naivete, not knowing anything about the business of this, we said, sure, we'll start a school. And what we found is that people believed in us, not just the people who came and took the programs, but the people who, like John, we came and said, we've got this idea. What do you think? Said, this is a great idea. And not like, well, have you thought about the insurance liability? <laughs> um, none of us thought about those things initially. And it was a good thing, because he probably would have turned and run. Um, but as we look ahead, you know, what we're really looking at is all of the future people who can join us, and all of you who have joined us in the past, we look forward to, to working with more and more in the future. The Institute's mission and the mission of the center is really to connect people, nature, and community through education. Education is a tool, but our goal really is to broaden the definition of home. When we think of home, I want us to think of more than just our houses, our neighborhoods, our towns, our cities, our communities, but to think also of the larger landscape, the natural world that we sit on, that our towns and communities live in, and which sustain us. And so hopefully when people talk about home, they will think of this larger place. They'll think of the North Cascades, the Skagit Watershed, the Pacific Northwest, and understand this is a unique and special place, the kind of place that has drawn all of us here to this region to live and work, and all of us here today to help celebrate this event. Where am I? OK. Um, a couple things about institute teaching I think that's important, because this place has been designed with these sort of central tenets in mind. We seek to promote community education and involvement and stewardship by paying attention to home landscapes and teaching for a sense of place. 
teaching at the convergence of the natural sciences, the humanities, and the arts. So it's much more than just science. Affirming human history as um, integral to the history of landscape. People are a part of this landscape and have been for thousands and thousands of years. And also by encouraging ex exploration in the out of doors. So much of school these days is about putting people indoors in very isolated environments and giving them lots of information. And lots of information do not create wise people. What we're trying to do is help build a culture help start that kind of, of thinking and education that helps people think about that really what people need is these are these intimate, powerful experiences as kids in these kinds of wild places that then inform everything else they do throughout their lives. And it always comes back to places like this. What we hope this place will be that um, you know, people's lives do get changed in these small ways so that later they'll take the time to write a letter to the editor go to all those innumerable public meetings, vote, and do all those great things. The Institute and our programs, we're not political, we're not an advocacy organization, but, but we are advocates for people being in, in, involved and engaged in the process. So if somebody takes one of our programs, whether it's a kid or adult, and they go and they write a letter to the editor, that's the real measure of success, no matter what side of the issue they come out on, because they've gotten some information and they're putting it to use. So in that case, we are advocates. We're advocates for people being part of their communities and making that make a difference. I wanted to change gears for a moment, um, and I'm really honored here today to, to announce the public kickoff of what we call Reach for the Peaks, the, cam the campaign to complete the funding for the North Cascade and Vermont Learning Center. Reach for the Peaks is a three-year, $2.5 million, no, $2 million fundraising effort to do two things. To complete the furnishings and equipping of the center, which is part of our institute responsibility, and also, also to develop new programs and expand programs for uh, increasing audiences. I also want to thank the honorary chairs of this effort, uh, Seattle Mayor Paul, Paul Schell, Mountaineer Jim Whitaker, and novelist Barbara Kingsolver, who unfortunately are not here today, although we have something from Barbara to read a little bit later, for their efforts in our cause. I also want to acknowledge the efforts of Jean Gorton, our board chair of the Reach for the Peace campaign. Jean, where are you? <laughs> this campaign is a three-year campaign. The first year just ended. It's been the quiet phase. We've been learning all these things about the fundraising world. But thanks to Gene's leadership, I'm proud to announce today that in the past year we've raised over $1 million from individuals, businesses, and foundations throughout the Northwest towards this goal. In addition, <laughs> in addition the Institute Board of Directors has contributed over $130,000 individually. And just yesterday, we got a phone call that the Rathman Family Foundation is making a $75,000 gift towards equipping the ELC. So we're on a roll with this, and it's really fun. <laughs> I'd also like to recognize one other individual here who's here today, Dave Bond. Dave, are you out there? Right over there. Dave, somebody for, for those of you who don't know him, is somebody who spends a lot of his time in the North Cascades. He hikes, and he climbs, and he, he just he's out there. And he's do do uh, donated tremendous hours of just volunteer time to helping the Park Service and other organizations that help the North Cascades. I just wanted to acknowledge Dave for the single largest individual gift that the Institute has ever received, $112,000 for the Learning Center. And Dave, thank you for your leadership and your commitment. In addition to funding the completion of the center, um, the campaign has really got one other or several other uh, major goals. The most important one is to double scholarships for children and adults. Additional scholarships will allow us to help low-income and minority participants, school kids in particular, and ensure diversity among those we serve. Each year, we currently allocate uh, need-based award awards of more than $150,000 to kids' programs, another $25,000 to adult programs, and we're hoping to double that uh, through this campaign. It will also enable us to increase opportunities for in-depth study and research at the center, provide for academic assessment and evaluation of new and existing programs, fund the development of the Discovery Boathouse, a new piece that'll be sitting there right as you enter the center, which will be a, a base for programs that come here and then go, go out and buy canoe or backpack 
to other areas in the region and create a new graduate program in cooperation with Western Washington University, a two-year master's program in environmental education, one year of which will be residential at Huxley College at Bellingham, and a second year where the student graduate students will be in residence here for a year, being part of our core teaching staff. In addition, the center, through its existing design and the work of the partners and the architects, uh, is fully accessible. So not only the accessible buildings, but the accessible trails and accommodations will provide opportunities for wilderness exploration to the elderly and disabled in ways that have not been uh, available before. So um, one of the tents we have there, at one of the white tents on there, is our Reach for the Peaks campaign tent. I encourage you to go and check it out and see how you can get involved in that as well. In closing, um, I believe it's essential that we know how the world works if we're to make good, intelligent decisions about the future of our communities. I believe that education is the beginning of knowledge, awareness, caring, passion, and involvement. At the Learning Center, with the help of our partners, we will build and engage an ec ecologically literate public here in the Pacific Northwest, one which will speak responsibly for the landscape of home. Thanks. Thank you, Saul, for everything. Uh, I had the privilege and pleasure of meeting a individual earlier today for the first time. She's a 13-year-old who's not only brave but extremely bright, and we're going to call her to the microphone right now to share one of her summer experiences with all of us. So would you please welcome Allison Barr. Ever since I can remember, I've longed to for adventure. My parents tell me that as a little girl, I would wander away from them without ever looking back. I would spy a dandelion across the meadow, a butterfly in the flowers, or blackberries too high for me to reach, and there's no stopping me. As I've gotten older, my desire for wildness had stay has stayed strong and deep. Last summer, my friend Hannah and I took a canoe camp through North Cascades Institute. Along with nine other kids our age and two leaders, Stephen and Christy, we paddled the waters of Ross Lake. Though strangers at first, we came to depend upon one another and learn to read the water. We studied the plants and animals that lived among us. We swam in the cool water and gathered branches for the fire. One memory stays with me the most. It was the last night of camp. For a treat, we got to paddle to Cougar Island at the end of the lake and spend the night. We had to paddle for hours against the wind to reach there. Despite my week of paddling, my arms were so tired they were stiff. They ached and ached. The shore seemed a million miles away. My friend and I sang songs to keep our spirits up. When we finally reached camp, we made hot chocolate. It was the best I'd ever tasted. <laughs> Later that night, when it was almost dark, and Hannah and I had decided to explore the island, we were walking along and all of a sudden I jumped. There was a big skeleton underneath the tree. It looked like it was from a deer. We were freaked out and ran back to tell Christy. She calmed us down and suggested that we walk back to look at the deer together. At first, we wanted to go back, but we did. As we sat down, we noticed that its teeth were worn down and its skeleton was perfect. We realized that the deer was very old and had died a natural death. We figured out that it had swam all this way to choose a special place to die. Walking back to camp under the stars, I felt that the deer's skeleton was a thing of beauty. When camp ended, I didn't want to leave. As I headed home, I thought, is it reality I'm going back to or coming back from? I have paddled in the light of the sun and the moon, and as I sleep, I feel the water still surrounding me. I dream of stroking paddles with my friends. I'm drawn to the dream. Thank you. Thank you, Ellie. That was really nice. Our next speaker is Larry Campbell, and he is a member of the Swinomish Indian Tribal Community and also serves on the Board of Directors of North Cascades Institute. So please welcome to the microphone, Larry Campbell. Thank you, Pete. I'd like to take this opportunity on behalf of the Swinomish Indian Tribal Community, the Upper Skagit Tribal Community, the Sox Soil Tribal Community, and the Samish. 
one of my responsibilities that I have with my tribe is that I, I honor the request of schools, organizations, universities who want to know more about tribal history and tribal culture. As I go out, even into the universities, we ask, we ask students at our local universities, how many tribes are there in Skagit County? And they're lucky if a quarter of the students know how many tribes are in Skagit County. It's, it's an important part of the history that needs to be brought out. And that's one of the reasons why I was recruited to serve on the board of directors for North Cascade Institute. I eagerly accepted. I've also had the opportunity to teach classes with the Elder Hospital for several, for several years, which was a very gratifying experience of bringing the tribal history and the culture, try to give it in a perspective that we can we can begin to share. Our people be able to maintain their traditional ways depend on the salmon. The salmon, as we hear so many times, the salmon and the Indian here in the Skagit Valley are inseparable. Our culture, our traditions, our ceremonies depend on the salmon. It's, we start, we begin, and we end with that salmon. I've had the opportunity, I've been very fortunate that I grew up here. My father was Upper Skagit, so I grew up in the little town of Concrete that you passed coming up the way. That was my father's people, my mother's people were Swinomish. Saltwater people, freshwater people. The Skagit, saltwater, freshwater people, mountain people who knew the honey. I was very fortunate to receive teachings from my grandparents on both sides. So I know this, the Skagit River, the Baker River, Lake Shannon. Those were my playgrounds when I grew up as a young boy. Nobody ever told me that Lake Shannon, the water was cold. We just had to jump into that thing and get over that initial shock. <laughs> Later on, I, stuck my, I went up there a few years ago, I stuck my toe in there and I said, I wondered how I ever stood that. <laughs> but that's where we played. That's where we learned. We grew up around the salmon. The upper Skagit in the old days, they couldn't fish with a net, so we learned how to fish with a rod and a reel. My grandfather, he knew how to catch the fish. My father used to catch 45, 50 pound king salmon. At least once or twice a year on the rod and reel, taking almost an hour to get into the beach. I learned that. When we moved to my mother's people with Swinomish, we learned about gilding, we learned about salt water. We learned that tides, that water goes a whole bunch of different ways. It goes this way, it goes that way, it goes up and it goes down. And it's, and it's different from when you get up here, the river just goes one way, straight down. As I was coming up here today, wondering what I was going to say to the group of people here, I was overwhelmed overwhelmed with what I heard earlier of saying wilderness. This is not a wilderness, this is home. The community that I come from, the Southern Mission Indian Tribal Community, our elders tell us that why did we choose that name? We're made up of four different tribal groups, the Kikialis, the Samish, the Lower Skagit, and the Southern Mission. And when we chose a name for ourselves, we incorporated in 1936, they said they, they wanted the Swinomish Indian tribal community because our elders says we want our descendants, the children, the grandchildren, the great-grandchildren who grew up to always remember to retain our tribal identity that is going to take a sense of community. They're always going to have to remember that sense of community to survive as Indian people. I think our, our tribal people now are ready to share what we know as Indian people. A scientist. I consider our Indian people the first scientists in this part of the world. We've had thousands of years to learn, to watch, to observe, and learn how to live with the patterns of life. We've understood that. One of the reasons why I agreed to sit on this is because I see an opportunity through the classes at North Cascade Institute for that to reawaken 
to find the keys to understanding to our children who attend the public schools, to find a reinterest into science so that they, they can be they can be find successful careers in to defending the environment. Some of the key words that you've heard from the prior speakers is community. Is community. I encourage each and every one of you who are here today, encourage your children. Talk to your children. That's what they tell us that our elders tell us. Talk to your children. Talk to your children that this is home. This country places great pride in your mobility view where we have a great big huge country that we can go over to find the place to find happiness. Well, happiness is right here. In the words of Chief Seattle, he was saying, the earth is made of the ashes of our people. What he was talking about was the fact that we've lived here for thousands of years. We've lived here for thousands of years and we cherish this. There's been government programs that try to get us away from our reservations, from our communities, but they misunderstood how close we were to our families. So we keep coming back. I've only been out of the Skagit Valley three years of my life. And I was so happy to come back home to the Skagit Valley because it is truly wonderful. The diversity that is here is truly great. Like one of the, the books I think Saul wrote, From the Mountains to the Sea, it was really, it was really affected me because it reminded me of all the things in a short period, a, a short distance that we can experience. We can experience a lot of life here, a lot of science, a lot of diversity. So let's celebrate that diversity. Let's celebrate this. Let's build a culture here in the Skagit Valley, in the Skagit County, so that we can come together and to be as one. This is one of the reasons why I agreed to serve on the board, was because with the idea that we will integrate tribal history and tribal culture and the things that our tribal people know within all of the courses offered by North Cascade Institute. We're not going to make it distinct and separate. We're going to integrate it so it, it flows, it gets in there seamlessly. And that's what is going to help to create that sense of community that we all, we as Indian people now are starting to understand that we need to expand out to include you into our circles so that we can be as one people, so that we can form that community, so that we can form that new community that really treasures the Skagit Valley as home. Teach that to your children and trust your children to North Cascade Institute and they will begin to get that. I thank each and every one of you for being here, for your support for, for this, this project. Our tribe is really behind us because they see an opportunity. They see an opportunity that is going to open up the keys to understanding. Maybe open up those, the minds of that dormant scientist that are in, into our children. They have trouble in the public schools. Public schools fail to take in the Indian way of teaching. We understand and we see education, what North Cascade Institute is talking about, a holistic way of learning. When you're teaching science from a book, it's theory. But when you're into the field, it's hands-on experience, something that you can touch and that you can feel and that you can smell. I read in a book by Richard White, a historian from the University of Washington. He was asking the Nisqually Indian fisherman, how did you learn how to catch this fish? Expecting some kind of mythical and romantic answer. And he looked at him like he was stupid. I learned by doing it. And this is what we have to do. We have to come together and we do it. And thanks for the partnerships. We were also part of these partnerships of the FERC relicensing process. We find that the partnerships with Seattle State Light National Park Service has been at times difficult, but it has stood the test of time. So we see this as another step into that test of time that we can form these relationships. And as we say, when we put our minds together, our elders always tell us when we put our minds together and think as one, we can accomplish great things. Separately, we're crippled. 
So with this, I see this partnership here today of coming to serve a great good for our children, your children. Your children are my children. My children are your children. Let's never forget that. Thank you very much. And thank you, Larry, for your words of wisdom. Now, instead of the traditional breaking of ground, uh, and taking away from the site, uh, we are going to instead begin a process of giving back to the site by planting a tree. So, while one speaker representing each of the partners walk to the tree planting site, uh, we're going to call to the microphone the Education Director of North Cascades Institute, Tracy Johannesson. Tracy? Thank you. I'm going to give these guys a little bit of time to get up to the designated spot here, but I can tell you a little bit about what we'll be doing. The uh, North Cascades Environmental Learning Center will not only be a place that practices uh, reducing, reusing, and recycling, those three R's that many of us are familiar with, but also a fourth R, and that is restoration. A big part of uh, building this facility is going to be restoring this site after the construction of the buildings. And so this is a symbolic gesture helping us get started in that effort. The Douglas maple that will be planted is a permanent memory of our presence here today. It's symbolic of over 21,000 native plants that are being pro propagated from seeds collected on this site by the National Park Service that will be replanted at the close of construction. Following the tree planting, Pete Kremen will have a few closing remarks. But first I have something that I'd like to read to you. Yesterday, we received a telegram from the award-winning author, Barbara Kingsolver, who is an NCI instructor and one of the chairs of our Reach for the Peaks campaign. I'd like to read to you her words before the tree is planted. So this is from Barbara. Greetings to the groundbreaking celebration. Years ago, I wrote a novel, Animal Dreams. A paragraph comes very close to summing up my philosophy of living, and it was this. The very least you can do in your life is to figure out what you hope for. And the most you can do is to live inside that hope. Not admire it from a distance, but live right in it, under its roof. What I want is so simple that I almost can't say it. Elementary kindness. Enough to eat, enough to go around. The possibility that kids might one day grow up to be neither the destroyers nor the destroyed. And that's about it. Right now, I'm living that hope, running down its hallway and touching the walls on both sides. Today, as the North Cascades Institute and its partners break ground for the Environmental Learning Center that so many people have dreamed of for years of creating, I feel I'm being given a gift of hope in future years, people will come here to learn about the environment that shelters and sustains us, the natural systems that we do not own, but to which we, as a species, belong. And those people will grow to be neither the destroyers nor the destroyed, but responsible citizens of a habitat, a food web, and a planet. I would like to express my gratitude to all the people who worked hard to reach this point in the building of the Environmental Learning Center. Thanks to their work, past and future, and with the support of everyone here, we have the chance to live inside our hope, running down its hallway and touching the walls on both sides. Barbara Kingsolver. The Environmental Learning Center is just one of many educational efforts sponsored by Seattle City Light. For more information about what your electric utility offers, visit our website at www.cityofseattle.net forward slash light. This has been a special report your Seattle City Light.
This is a special report from your Seattle City Light. With energy prices rising sharply last summer, many electricity customers started to look for ways to save money through energy conservation. One proven way is through insulation of homes and the use of energy efficient windows. The U.S. Department of Energy estimates that the nation loses a lot of energy through single pane and older model windows. In fact, DOE claims the energy lost every year nationwide is equivalent to all the oil that flows through the Alaska pipeline. People buying or renting new constructed buildings already get the benefit of lessons learned the last time energy prices jump, the conservation standards that were introduced in building codes in the 1980s. However, older homes and apartments don't always have this advantage. City Light was an early pioneer in helping home and apartment owners to upgrade insulation and install new energy-saving windows in older units. Recently, City Light workers celebrated the completion of the 1,000 multifamily complex that it has helped to weatherize. As winter approaches, the days grow shorter and heaters across the city work harder and longer to keep us all warm and comfortable. I think it's very fitting that we're here at this time of year to celebrate the accomplishments of our multifamily weatherization program. Uh, my name is Glenn Atwood and I'm manager of the community conservation section. We provide uh, energy conservation information and programs to the utilities customers. And I'm very pleased to join you today in celebrating the weatherization of the 1,000th building that has participated in our multifamily weatherization program. Uh, multifamily, th this program launched in 1986. Its purpose was and remains to provide financial assistance to owners who want to weatherize their electrically heated buildings and apartment buildings and condominiums. And these include measures such as uh, more efficient windows, more insulation, and new lighting in the common areas. Um, 20 years ago, uh, we chose a path that has led to our internationally recognized uh, energy conservation uh, program. And um, in fact, what we are one of the largest public utilities who have continued to have a strong conservation program over the years and that's not only a reflection of City Light's priorities it is really a reflection of our community's priorities and as a public power a utility that's one of the things that we're most proud of is that we can be a microcosm of the th kinds of values the kinds of principles the kinds of priorities that our community holds dear and not only is low-cost energy one of those, but also the principles of protecting our environment is uh, key to that. And, and conservation measures is one of the best ways in which we can not only protect our environment, but also provide low-cost energy to all of our customers. This program blazed the path for us in really uh, providing a significant amount of energy savings and a significant amount of, of uh, bill reductions and a significant amount of comfort to all of our customers. Tammy Horiuchi, who owns the 50s Vintage Sixplex in Ballard, received a commemorative plaque from City Light, as did the contractors who did the work to upgrade the apartment's insulation and windows. We feel proud to be part of this program on energy conservation, which affects all of us as citizens of this country. And uh, we feel proud to be part of this and provide this comfort for tenants who live in this apartment. We're still here. <laughs> <laughs> we go back, uh, many of us go back to a time, uh, as far back, Joseph remembers conversations of 20 years ago, when we were talking about how by 1990 we had all better find uh, other career options because we'd be out of business. We all remember those conversations. Well, we're still here. There's still a job to be done. We've gone through uh, political disfavor and uh, political apathy, and now we're kind of back at a point where people are saying, and we really need to do that conservation thing just like we thought we did back in the 70s, and here we still are. Looking back to the beginning of City Light's apartment weatherization program, it's estimated that all the homes insulated have saved the equivalent of 171 million kilowatt hours of electricity, or enough power to heat and light 16,000 homes for a year. Building owners get help in paying for the upgrades through a subsidy from City Light that pays for between 40 and 45 percent of the materials and labor costs. That increases the value of the property, and apartment tenants get the advantage of lower electric bills and comfortable homes. 
homes. Seattle City Light is more committed than ever to increasing conservation in apartments. There are an estimated 1,500 complexes in Seattle that still could benefit from weatherization. That's thousands of tenants who could benefit from a drop in their utility bills. Work usually takes place with minimal disruption to tenants. City Light inspectors make sure that each window is quickly and properly installed. Experienced contractors can remove the old windows and install the new thermal windows in 20 to 30 minutes. For information on how to take advantage of City Light's conservation programs, visit our website at www.cityofseattle.net forward slash light forward slash conserve or call the conservation hotline at 206-684-3800. This has been a special report from your Seattle City Light. This is a special report from your Seattle City Light. With energy prices rising sharply last summer, many electricity customers started to look for ways to save money through energy conservation. One proven way is through insulation of homes and the use of energy efficient windows. The U.S. Department of Energy estimates that the nation loses a lot of energy through single pane and older model windows. In fact, DOE claims the energy lost every year nationwide is equivalent to all the oil that flows through the Alaska pipeline. People buying or renting newer constructed buildings already get the benefit of lessons learned the last time energy prices jump, the conservation standards that were introduced in building codes in the 1980s. However, older homes and apartments don't always have this advantage. City Light was an early pioneer in helping home and apartment owners to upgrade insulation and install new energy-saving windows in older units. Recently, City Light workers celebrated the completion of the 1,000th multifamily complex that it has helped to weatherize. And as winter approaches, the days grow shorter and heaters across the city work harder and longer to keep us all warm and comfortable. I think it's very fitting that we're here at this time of year to celebrate the accomplishments of our multifamily weatherization program. Uh, my name is Glenn Atwood and I'm manager of the Community Conservation Section. We provide uh, energy conservation information and programs to the utilities customers. And I'm very pleased to join you today in celebrating the weatherization of the 1,000th building that has participated in our multifamily weatherization program. Uh, multifamily, the, this program launched in 1986. Its purpose was and remains to provide financial assistance to owners who want to weatherize their electrically heated buildings and apartment buildings and condominium. 20 years ago, uh, we chose a path that has led to our internationally recognized uh, energy conservation uh, program. And um, in fact, what we are one of the largest public utilities who have continued to have a strong conservation program over the years. And that's not only a reflection of City Light's priorities, it is really a reflection of our community's priorities. And as a public power a utility, that's one of the things that we're most proud of is that we can be a microcosm of the th kinds of values, the kinds of principles, the kinds of priorities that our community holds dear. And not only is low-cost energy one of those, but also the principles of protecting our environment is uh, key to that. And, and conservation measures is one of the best ways in which we can not only protect our environment, but also provide low cost energy to all of our customers. This program has blazed the path for us in really uh, providing a significant amount of energy savings and a significant amount of, of uh, bill reductions and a significant amount of comfort to all of our customers. Tammy Horiuchi, who owns the 50s Vintage 6 Plex in Ballard, received a commemorative plaque from City Light, as did the contractors who did the work to upgrade the apartment's insulation and windows. Uh, we feel proud to be part of this program on energy conservation, which affects all of us as citizens of this country. And uh, we feel proud to be part of this and provide this comfort for tenants who live in these apartments. Thank you. We're still here. <laughs> <laughs> <Yay>. <laughs>
back, uh, many of us go back to a time, uh, as far back, Joseph remembers conversations of 20 years ago, when we were talking about how by 1990 we had all better find uh, other career options because we'd be out of business. We all remember those conversations. Well, we're still here. There's still a job to be done. We've gone through uh, political disfavor and uh, political apathy, and now we're kind of back at a point where people are saying, and we really need to do that conservation thing, just like we thought we did back in the 70s, and here we still are. Looking back to the beginning of City Lights apartment weatherization program, it's estimated that all the homes insulated have saved the equivalent of 171 million kilowatt hours of electricity, or enough power to heat and light 16,000 homes for a year. Building owners get help in paying for the upgrades through a subsidy from City Light that pays for between 40 and 45 percent of the materials and labor costs. That increases the value of the property, and apartment tenants get the advantage of lower electric bills and comfortable homes. Seattle City Light is more committed than ever to increasing conservation in apartments. There are an estimated 1,500 complexes in Seattle that still could benefit from weatherization. That's thousands of tenants who could benefit from a drop in their utility bills. Work usually takes place with minimal disruption to tenants. City Light inspectors make sure that each window is quickly and properly installed. Experienced contractors can remove the old windows and install the new thermal windows in 20 to 30 minutes. For information on how to take advantage of City Light's conservation programs, visit our website at www.cityofseattle.net forward slash light forward slash conserve or call the conservation hotline at 206-684-3800. This has been a special report from your Seattle City Light. higher, we try to set our winter end block price for residential customers to reflect that marginal cost. And so that's looking like the winter end block would be going up. The differential between the summer and the winter would be coming down. Um, we set first rate block rates so as not... <laughs>